to live streaming. We're going live. Okay, you're live now. Great. So welcome everybody to the second and final day and the final session of uh, the conference on aging, COVID-19 and the adoption of health technology. Uh, my name is Karim. I'm the executive director of the Center for Bioengineering and Biotechnology from the University of Waterloo. And along with me are two guest speakers, um, Dr. Josh Williams and Dr. Nashir Samnani. Now, I'll just start off with a very brief introduction on the Center for Bioengineering and Biotechnology. It is a University of Waterloo Center focused on um, health and enabling the translation, the uh, translation of uh, health research um, from the lab to the bedside and out there in the field. Um, the center has been around for many years. Um, and uh, if you go to the website, you can learn more about us. It's also one of the sponsors of this conference. I'll give you a little bit of an introduction on myself. I'm uh, I'm I'm from the University of Waterloo. I actually did my undergrad and my grad at the university as well. And um, I have have been involved in the development of X-ray technology, specifically related to health, for the last 20 years. I've also translated some of that technology into, into the commercial space, specifically in radiology. Um, we've actually got a company that makes these X-ray detectors. And these detectors are now being used across Canada for a variety of X-ray imaging tasks. Um, I'd like to very much welcome our first speaker, Josh Williams. He is the lead in project alignment and support, investment and performance, and he's part of the Digital Health Division, Ontario Ministry of Health. He's got more than 15 years of experience as a physiotherapist. He understands the gaps across health, the healthcare system that lead to poor experiences for patients and providers. Um, he also understands the passion and pride that healthcare workers bring to their roles and the innovation that happens in the pockets of the system and the untapped potential that still exists for digital transformation. And it was this experience that led him to a, to a role first with the Ontario Ministry of Health, where he now supports the implementation of the Digital First for Health strategy. He's also pursuing an MBA at the University of Toronto, which is also my alma mater. And he's a lecturer in the Department of Physical Therapy at the University of Toronto. I'll turn the floor over to Josh. Uh, thanks very much, Kareem, for that introduction. I feel like I should put a correction out there first that although I've been in school for a really long time, I do not have a doctorate degree, um, so I can just go by Josh Williams. Um, but happy to say that the second master's will be completed in about three weeks time. So I'm going to share my screen here and hope that this pulls up in full. Uh, okay. So as Kareem said, I work in the Ontario Ministry of Health in the Digital Health Division, and I'm happy to be here today to talk a little bit about the Ministry's Digital First for Health strategy. Uh, some of the, the changes that we have seen and the lessons that we have learned through uh, the pandemic and, and what our aspirations are uh, for the long term as we see success in the implementation of this strategy. And so just to frame how this strategy came to be, um, I will preface this by saying that this is, you know, what, what's listed here is, is before COVID. There was obviously an interest from Canadians to participate in their care using digital channels, uh, over two thirds of Canadians expressing that. Um, and three quarters of Canadians interested in using patient portals or digital tools to access their personal health information. And so what we overwhelmingly heard was that patients were looking for more choice in how they interact with the healthcare system. Um, you know, prior to the pandemic, we were seeing virtual care, you know, at a level of one to 2%. And so really there wasn't a lot of choice. It was in person or nothing. Um, and they wanted to easily access and control their health information. I think that's been a theme that has been expressed in a number of the different talks that have gone on through the conference today. Um, I think for providers, what they're looking for is they don't want to be burdened with paperwork um, and they want to be spending more time helping and treating their patients. You know, I got into the healthcare field because I liked working with people 
And I'll tell you one of the things that I liked least about my job was the amount of time doing documentation, other paperwork, sending faxes. Um, yes, there are still faxes, even though Nova had said that we're working to get rid of faxes. Um, and really providers want a better work experience as well. Um, you've heard from other speakers about the challenges for innovators to get a toehold into the health system. And so how can we support innovators to both create um, you know, economic improvements um, and job creation, but also to deliver solutions to the healthcare system that support better patient care? And lastly, for government, you know, in a single payer system, we're responsible for um, making sure that the funds are there to um, deliver care today and be sustainable to deliver care tomorrow. And so how do we ensure that there is value for money in what we're investing in? How do we make sure that we're delivering healthcare in the most efficient way? And how do we support system transformation from one that was predominantly bricks and mortar to one that uses multiple channels, including digital? And so from that, um, this is the current digital strategy for health um, that the ministry is proposing. You can see that it's built on five different pillars, and these five different pillars are meant to support the transformation of the healthcare system into one that is more integrated, sustainable, and patient-centered. And I think what we've seen, um, you know, in parallel, you have prior again to the pandemic, the Ontario health system uh, transforming to deliver a new model of integrated care um, through Ontario health teams, that that model of integrated care is really enabled by strong digital capabilities. Um, and so those OHTs can be the mechanism to support some of this um, digital transformation. And so we have you know, virtual care. Um, how do we improve system navigation? Um, working in healthcare, it's really complicated for me to understand the system. Now step outside of that and how challenging it is it for a patient, their family or a caregiver to find the right care. And then how do they have choice over how they access that care? And so maybe they would prefer to access it in their own home using virtual care technologies. Maybe they prefer to um, access it in person. Maybe they prefer um, to access it asynchronously through remote patient monitoring platforms or secure email or secure messaging. And so how do we enable that choice? Uh, online appointment booking. I think we've seen the importance of this as we look, roll out uh, the vaccinations for COVID um, and, and the launch of the, the provincial portal to access online appointment booking. And so how do we take lessons learned from that and then apply it to other healthcare services? I mentioned the importance of digital access for patients to their health information. And so making sure that records are available to patients when they want them, where they want them, so that they can be partners in care and the care that they can receive will be better and safer for them. On the flip side of that, how do we ensure that providers have the right information in front of them, whether it's the patient's historical information or access to the current best practice standards? And so how do we provide better and more connected tools for frontline providers so that, that information moves seamlessly across the continuum of care? And at those transition points, nothing is lost. And then enabling um, access to new technologies. Um, you know, one of the benefits of working in a single payer healthcare system is the amount of data that is produced um, and stored. And so how do we start to leverage those data assets to provide better insights into what's driving the costs of care delivery, um, what kind of patients may benefit from um, certain, certain models of care, um, and how do we start to bend that cost curve? And all of this is enabled by our privacy legislation. And so how do we look at privacy legislation and update it to reflect this more modern transformative care environment? And so that was what we set out in November 2019 to do. Um, and then a global pandemic struck. And so what have we learned from that? I think we've learned that Ontarians and clinicians are ready to adopt virtual care. And I'll show you some of the, the stats and some of the programs and, and some of the um, proposals that the ministry is working on, which gets to this idea of, of new models of care. Um, navigation services are critical in finding and accessing the right care services. And what does a digital front door look like to support that streamlined navigation service? Um, Something that's really exciting and, and really critical 
to unlock the potential in, in the strategy is a digital identity. And so how can we follow a single patient across different episodes of care? How can we ensure that the services delivered in an online or mobile environment are delivered to the right individual? And how do we ensure that that experience for people, even though it may be on a number of different platforms, feels like a integrated, seamless, single experience? And digital identity is one of the ways that that can be supported. Um, and this was just um, you know, recently launched in a small test pilot at a couple of sites um, this month. Interoperability is a patient safety issue. So that ability to have one information system talk to another information system to transfer information between those two systems to ensure that um, the health, the physical healthcare system that it supports is connected and that that information is available at the front lines to providers when they need it. Um, digital health innovators continue to struggle to engage the province, um, though I think you know we're starting to lay some of the foundational groundwork to hopefully make that easier. And lastly, um, how do we deliver impactful change to sectors that may be historically underserved? So long-term care homes, um, and you heard Brett speak about uh, some of the ways that digital is enhancing the care delivery in long-term care homes in the previous talk home care, um, so that more care can be delivered in the community. And so overall, the Digital First for Health is an ambitious vision. We had many in-flight initiatives that have been accelerated by COVID. And so some of our successes to date, um, obviously the rapid uptake in virtual care that we've seen globally also occurred here. Some early data analysis shows that approximately 70% of ambulatory care services were being delivered virtually through the initial parts of the pandemic. And when I say ambulatory care services, you can think about you know, a visit to your doctor's office, a clinic visit to a hospital, 70% um, of those being delivered virtually. 86% of providers offering some form of virtual care and about 26% of Ontarians accessing virtual care services. So that's pretty exciting. And again, I think speaks to this um, readiness to adopt virtual care. The challenge will be is what are those right models moving forward? So now that we've overcome that first barrier, how do we design a system of the future that delivers the right model of care, a mix likely of in-person and virtual? And so in, in that vein, um, the province has also launched a number of virtual care programs, including remote patient monitoring, virtual urgent care, virtual surgical transitions, and virtual home and community care to you know, predominantly support the COVID-19 response efforts, but to lay the groundwork for some of that transformation. And these programs um, are currently deployed across the province with an expectation that they will serve over 30,000 patients uh, before the end of the month. I talked briefly about the launch of a patient identity service. And so the expectation here is that this will allow, you know, in, in its initial phase between 30,000 and 50,000 Ontarians to access healthcare services and their health information in a secure and private way. We have patient portals that are connecting to provincial assets. The example provided here is uh, the Ontario Laboratory Information System that stores lab results like blood tests um, or you know, more recently COVID tests. Um, and so patients using a third party portal and accessing their lab results from across the continuum of care, not just the organization that has deployed the portal. And, you know, using um, innovations that have been developed in the private sector, like the Apple Health app on iPhones um, and, you know, hospitals have started to use that to deliver patient records. And so uh, some in Ontario include Women's College Hospital, St. Joseph's Health, Hamilton, and Mackenzie Health. Uh, we talked about interoperability previously, uh, and one of the ways to enable that interoperability is through regulations and policy, and the Digital Health Information Exchange is going to be that policy that supports interoperability. And amendments were recently made to our privacy legislation to identify the organization that will be responsible for setting those interoperability requirements and what the responsibilities of health information custodians, those who hold personal health information, 
and the vendor community will be to comply with those requirements. And lastly, um, the launch of the Ontario Health Data Platform, which is a big data platform that has really been used to support our COVID response. Um, and so some of the information you may have seen come out of the Ontario Science Advisory Table um, is leveraging insights pulled from this platform, such as identifying at-risk populations for COVID, predicting surge capacity in hospitals, or linking risk factors with morbidity and mortality from COVID-19. And so building off of the initial strategy honeycomb, the lessons that we've learned to date, the successes that we've had, what do things look like differently in the future? And so I think for virtual care, patients are able to see the, their doctor at their convenience in the comfort of their own home should they choose. Providers will have more choice in how they offer services to patients and innovators will know what the standards are to build to so that they can meet the needs of patients and providers. And so ensuring that video visits are available at home, that Ontario health teams understand what their virtual care requirements are as it relates to adoption and spread. Um, and you know, modernizing existing ministry programs like the Telehealth Ontario service to create that streamlined healthcare navigation service or digital front door that was discussed previously. The vision for online appointment booking, again, the idea that a patient can choose how they want to um, acquire an appointment and whether that be in person or online, it meets their needs whenever they want it. And innovators, again, understand what the standards to build to are and will have access then to uh, the market for providers to implement these. Digital access for patients. We want patients to be able to have access to, to be able to review their health record online and again, become those partners in care and make informed in choices about their care. Um, you know, providers will then be interacting with patients who are more informed um, to, you know, maybe guide the care, um, but will also have access to the necessary patient information where they need it, when they need it to support clinical decision making. And a constant theme for innovators here is a standards based marketplace so that on innovators know what standards they're building to. And how do we support digital access for patients? I spoke already about the digital identity project. We talked about how OHTs are that transformation vehicle um, and how do we ensure that that innovative consumer applications can continue to uh, integrate in a consistent and standardized way with provincial data assets so that patients have more options in how they can access their data. It doesn't just need to be through that hospital deployed patient portal. More tools for frontline providers. Uh, so ensuring patients are able to access their records across multiple health service providers and providers have that same experience. Um, where, you know, if, if I, I show up to uh, my primary care office, they have the reports from when I was in the hospital or vice versa. If I require an inpatient stay at a hospital, the hospital has access to my primary care records. Um, one of the, the ways that we're hoping to do this is um, through modernizing our provincial digital health infrastructure, what many might know is the electronic health record. Um, to ensure that data, not just from hospitals, not just from parts of home care, um, but from all care delivery organizations are available in that centralized um, manner and are accessible through either provincial clinical viewers, or as we said previously, some of those consumer applications are consuming provincial data in a way that is protecting privacy and is ensuring security. And then lastly, on big data and predictive analytics, really just making it easier for Ontario companies, for health system leaders, for researchers to have access to those health data assets, again, in a privacy protected and secure manner. Um, and you can see that there, you know, making re-identification of health data an offense under privacy legislation as a possible idea to um, ensure that privacy protection and security. And really, you know, by leveraging innovation, by leveraging research, by leveraging health system leaders, data is driving the decision. So patients might get better management of their chronic disease. They might 
get earlier intervention because of the predictive analytic capabilities of health service providers because of what they've learned through data. Um, high risk populations and patients can be identified and managed more effectively. And so do we understand what dementia looks like across the province? What's driving um, you know, care service delivery for dementia patients? What is best and then how to scale that across the province? And ultimately for government, again, the, the decisions are data informed, evidence driven, um, and so that we can ensure the sustainability of the healthcare system today and for future generations. And on that note, I will stop sharing um, and, and thank you for uh, allowing me the opportunity to speak about the ministry strategy. Perfect. Thank you for that, Josh. Uh, very uh, exciting presentation. We've we've actually had some of the um, attendees to the conference submit some questions in advance. So if you don't mind, I'll uh, I'll go through a few of those now, and I think they pertain really well. And I think you may have answered part of them in your talk. Yeah. So one question that came out of this was. As we adopt these innovations of digital technology and healthcare, how do we maintain the human aspect, the compassionate side of healing that has already been proven to have a non-trivial positive impact to health outcomes? We're going virtual, everything's gonna be online, but how do we keep the human touch? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a really good question. And I think it really gets at the benefits of some of these digital technologies. Um, you know, if you read Eric Topol, the message of his books is really that technology is going to unburden clinicians from some of these tasks that are required when, you know, looking at a computer or, you know, the documentation that goes with a clinical encounter or some of the steps that have to happen after a clinical encounter. And if that can be improved through technology, it frees the clinician up to do what they want to do and provide that empathetic um, you know, caregiver-like role in the encounter. And so I, I, I'm an optimist in that sense, that, and I agree with Topol that I think the, the benefits of technology to remove some of those tasks that, you know, could be considered low value by a patient and redeploying that provider to deliver high value empathetic care is, mm -hmm. is one of the promises. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. It on, on that same on that same question, I'll just ask a follow up. Uh, what do you think of all of these advances in AR, alternate reality, and virtual reality, AR, VR? That's really being spearheaded by the gaming industry, right? Like video games, it's a, it's it's kind of an interesting space, but uh, they try to make that immersive experience so the gamer feels like they're involved in the game. I wonder if there's opportunity for this in healthcare. I mean, we still have fax machines, so let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. That said, um, I, I think, you know, what is going to be key, at least in the near term, is patient choice. And, and so how do we design the system so that patient choice is sort of that first order um, thing that gets addressed? And so if, if my choice is I want to interact with my physician in an AR environment, um, great. Maybe that will happen. I, I don't think so. Although um, looking at other industries, banking especially, as they reduce their physical footprint, um, are looking at how to recreate the in-branch experience through AR. Um, but you know, if, if I want to interact with my clinician via phone and that meets my needs, it, it should be able to happen. If I want to interact via video and it's clinically appropriate, that should be able to happen. And so by embedding patient choice as the primary principle, um, I, I think that will get at, you know, both the advantages of technology um, and minimize potentially some of those drawbacks of people who can't access virtual reality and, and augmented reality environments. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that may, I think that's a good point. Uh, we, we've seen AR and VR take off on the healthcare provider side, maybe not as much with the patient interaction, but I do know, for example, in radiology, they've already started making these little headsets 
that the radiologist can wear. And it's the equivalent of looking at those three monitors they usually look at when they're analyzing X-ray or CT or MR. So I know that that stuff is already uh, on the go and who knows um, where it's going to end up, but it's really very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, the second question that came across was, are there systems to share knowledge regarding the implementation and spread of digital initiatives across the various provinces and territories? And if yes, what is something that you have learned from another province that has been important to your work? Hmm. That's a, a good question. And I think this might be an opportunity for um, us, not the ministry, but the province to brag um, in that Ontario is one of the leaders. I think if, if I was to learn anything throughout this entire time, um, during COVID especially, where um, you know, the federal government and the provinces have really tried to come together and respond in, in a somewhat coordinated way. When it comes to digital health and virtual care, provinces and territories are looking to Ontario as a leader. What is Ontario doing as it relates to delivering video care? What is Ontario doing in remote patient monitoring? What is Ontario doing in exposure notification, if we look at the COVID alert app as you know, a made in Ontario innovation that was adopted federally, um, I, I think that is, is the one thing that I've learned. Um, I will um, also in, in that vein sort of highlight um, a group that we work with um, through, through the role of the Ministry of Health. And this is a, a group out of Women's College Hospital, the Center for Digital Health Evaluation. Um, who have been helping us understand some of the um, implications of this rapid virtualization of care. Um, they, they have been, again, as Ontario in other ways has been identified as a leader, identified as a leader as well. And so I think there's going to be some opportunities moving forward where we'll have further collaboration across the provinces to understand you know, what works, what doesn't work, and, and maybe spin our wheels a little bit less as we try to adopt something new because it's been proven somewhere else. Fantastic. No, that's uh, that's great. I'm happy to be in uh, Ontario. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we'll move on to our next speaker. Um, and just keeping an eye on the time. So I'd, it's my it's my great pleasure. Thank you, Josh. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Nashir Simnani. And uh, he may correct me and say he's not a doctor, but I hope not. Um, he's actually the founder of uh, Perk Logic, and he's also a representative of uh, Generations Calgary. Um, at Quark Logic, he leads his team in bringing innovative new collaborative technologies for use by learners and educators in education and by professionals and teams in business. He also chairs the team that's responsible for the design and construction of Generations Calgary. It's a project um, out in Calgary um, that he's going to talk about today. And uh, he's served as the chair of the United Way in Calgary and area. He's on the mayor's task forces to end homelessness and the Calgary Poverty Reduction Initiative. He has also served on the Council of Champions for Upstart, that's the United Way's Children's Initiative, and is a community champion for Momentum Calgary. So very happy to have uh, you, Nashir, and, and for you um, giving your time, and uh, please, uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Karim. Uh, and Karim, I'm not a doctor as well. I can, uh, <laughs> might make up for, uh, for it in experience, but uh, certainly don't have the academic uh, qualifications. But uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, can you see my presentation? You can. Okay. All right. So, uh, so I want to uh, today spend some time sharing with uh, everyone the Generations Project in Calgary. It's a project uh, for uh, supporting uh, older adults uh, with the physical and virtual design that that uh, took on. A slightly diff different perspective than most uh, designs do, and I'm going to provide you with some insights in terms of the project, uh, in terms of some of the thinking behind the project, and uh, I will show you uh, some of the elements of the project as well. So let's start out with uh, a background. Uh, Generations is a not-for-profit uh, based project that was set up to drive best uh, practices, and the aim was to provide seniors with a holistic uh, approach 
at meeting their uh, daily needs. Uh, the Calgary pilot project, uh, it is a pilot project uh, and it's set up as a multi-generational housing facility with three distinct phases that I'll talk about. Um, and it's designed to be a model for aging in place, providing best in class practices in continuing care and assisted living. So uh, before we started the project, uh, we actually undertook uh, quite a bit of uh, extensive research and uh, the research actually helped us to uh, get um, some uh, conceptual thinking around what is possible in a design. And uh, one of the challenges that we were facing at an early stage was that if we were actually looking at trying to um, raise the bar of service delivery to um, seniors, then we knew that we couldn't actually do a service delivery um, in isolation of the building program itself. And so the first thing that we undertook was extensive research to actually look at uh, projects both locally uh, in North America, but internationally as well. Uh, we researched uh, all of the assisted living facilities that uh, currently exist in Canada. Uh, we uh, involved a whole bunch of designers and architects to help us think through the latest uh, best practices. And we engaged with multiple stakeholders, um, trying to get uh, feedback from them in terms of what uh, has been working for them and what uh, they desire to see, uh, see work better. Um, and uh, we also consulted with uh, lots of uh, practice uh, experts as well. All of that allowed us to actually come up with some thinking around the project that uh, led us to uh, a design concept that uh, was a much more integrated uh, project uh, concept. Um, and uh, part of the element of the design also uh, included looking at seniors' research and uh, 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 seniors' uh, health uh, and what impacts seniors' health. And we know that uh, when seniors um, socialize, work, or volunteer and exercise, that uh, the uh, level of well being and happiness actually goes up. We also know that uh, healthy social relationships actually tend to reduce uh, rates of depression and, and uh, provide for better cognitive health. Um, and physical activity uh, provides for higher levels of functional and cognitive health as well. And so part of our challenge was that, how do we take um, all of these elements and start to build them into a design uh, concept? Um, so uh, we framed uh, the uh, concept uh, as follows. Um, well, one of the key elements of uh, the project was that we wanted to ground ourselves in uh, very specific values, values of pluralism, values of volunteerism, values of uh, upholding uh, human dignity, um, and all, everything uh, in a uh, setting that was a community-based uh, setting. Uh, and looked at uh, offering programming uh, in the facility and uh, uh, providing physical spaces in the facility for all aspects of uh, needs of uh, the residents. Um, and a model that not only engaged the residents, but engaged uh, caregivers and families, and certainly uh, volunteers and uh, community. And uh, part of the mandate was to actually incorporate best practices in aging in a community setting. So uh, let's take a look at um, essential elements uh, that uh, uh, contributed to our uh, vision. Uh, before I actually talk about the vision itself, there are uh, multiple aspects of uh, well being for an individual uh, that uh, lives in uh, one of these facilities. And well, as you design a facility, you have to think about all of these at the outset. Um, and if you try to retrofit some of these concepts later on in a uh, building design, uh, we tend to find that uh, uh, we're trying to sometimes uh, deal with uh, issues and concepts that haven't really been planned well into the entire philosophy of the building uh, concept as well. And so we looked at all of these aspects of uh, mental well-being, you know, how um, individuals tend to uh, occupy their time meaningfully, um, the uh, aspect of relationships, strong relationships that actually bring out social well-being, uh, making sure that uh, uh, residents are able to financially uh, manage their uh, their lives well, um, making sure that uh, physical well-being is looked after on a daily basis so that uh, individuals have enough energy to get things done uh, meaningfully on a daily basis, 
and that whole sense of uh, belonging uh, within a community uh, setting. Um, uh, not to forget that uh, we needed to create an enabling environment that allowed one to practice their own faith, uh, their own uh, faith in a way that uh, 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 nurtured and uh, provide, uh, provided them with experiences that were meaningful for them, uh, not an environment that uh, impeded uh, any of that. And uh, from a cultural perspective, uh, needed to make sure that uh, we were culturally sensitive to all of the requirements of uh, individuals, uh, which included everything from meal plans to uh, making sure that uh, conversations uh, in the native languages were something that were also facilitated um, in the uh, 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 building as, uh, as well. So the building itself consists of three phases on the campus. Uh, it's, uh, it's one campus that actually is designed to house all of this. Phase one uh, was uh, 40 units for independent living. And uh, it's been in operation now since November of 2012. And uh, it's been working fairly well. Uh, phase two is assisted living 120 uh, continuing care units. Um, and uh, it includes uh, community spaces and uh, spaces for early childhood uh, development uh, and uh, spaces for intergenerational programming and volunteer engagement as well. Uh, that project has been uh, uh, opened uh, in September of 2019 and is currently operational. Uh, there are elements of the outside gardens that we're just finishing up uh, on that uh, project. Uh, but it is uh, already in operation. And phase three is a proposed multifamily housing um, uh, unit, uh, which is still in the early stages, uh, in the planning stages. So let's talk about the vision. Uh, given some of those elements, we needed to actually come up with a vision that actually drew uh, the uh, different programming um, aspects uh, and building aspects uh, into uh, and put it into practice. Uh, one of the uh, key elements was that we wanted to create an um, environment that uh, was a dignified place uh, for aging in place with a high uh, quality of life uh, for the residents uh, that uh, was provided in uh, a way that uh, residents felt uh, comfortable, they, were, they felt uh, safe, secure, respected, loved and cared for, and obviously the whole aspect of uh, allowing them to practice their faith. Um, and uh, allowing for um, extended concept of uh, community engagement in such a way that they had continual uh, companionships um, and continued uh, engagement in everything that happened on a daily basis. Um, and family uh, was a big part of uh, the engagement process, making sure that uh, this wasn't a place where um, uh, where individuals uh, were left on their own, but family engagement was uh, was re required and, and supported and uh, needed to be built into the building aspect uh, as well. Um, and many times we tend to forget the caregivers. And so we wanted to make sure that the programmatic aspects and the building aspects took into account uh, the needs of the caregivers um, with a focus on inter and generational interaction uh, and uh, bringing in uh, best in class uh, practices. And uh, also not forgetting that uh, older adults uh, have a lot to uh, offer to others as well. And so uh, there was uh, uh, plans and, uh, and programmatic uh, content that was designed into the building to make sure that uh, we uh, could tap into that wisdom and uh, experience and knowledge and talent that uh, older adults could actually offer to uh, uh, others. And a big element that was integrated into everything was uh, volunteerism, a uh, critical anchor in all of the ac activities around the project. So some of the design elements um, made sure that uh, we brought in uh, elements of uh, natural lighting, uh, the interplay of light and shade throughout the entire building, uh, making sure that every aspect of the building uh, brought out life and vibrancy. Um, and, you know, the notion of uh, of building uh, sometimes uh, can uh, be secondary to uh, pro programmatic uh, content, and we wanted to make sure that uh, we do this right. And to do it right, uh, for us, what what research showed was that you had to actually design the building to come to life to support all of the elements of what uh, took place on an everyday basis uh, inside that building. If the building design was not correct then some of the uh, essential elements of well-being uh, could not be supported uh, adequately. And so 
um, in every aspect of the design, uh, we were making sure that uh, the building came alive in a very meaningful way for the, the uh, residents, the caregivers, the families, and the uh, surrounding uh, community. Um, but uh, when you do that, uh, you need to make sure that uh, you take into account the needs of the residents as well. Uh, and while communal spaces are important to actually create uh, a, a community that's a vibrant community, you need to delineate between private and communal spaces so that you have uh, peaceful settings for uh, the residents uh, and you have uh, engaging environments when they want to uh, remain in a community setting and uh, making sure that uh, uh, all of this is done in an accessible manner. Um, uh, there are different buildings on the campus, and so we needed to make sure that there was interconnectivity between the uh, buildings. And um, so there are elements of uh, service delivery for the independent uh, residents that are in phase one of the uh, build, uh, phase one building um, uh, that uh, they can actually take part in the main building um, in phase two and engage in all of the activities that actually take place. Um, and uh, there is a sense of uh, belonging uh, so that they don't feel that they are isolated. The campus is actually designed to uh, come together. Um, and not only is the building uh, actually designed for this, but on the outside, we've got formal and informal courtyards and gardens and outdoor spaces um, that are designed to actually bring um, all of the uh, senses alive uh, with sights and sounds, uh, sounds of water and uh, rustling of the of the leaves in the wind and the uh, the chirping of birds and the children playing in the, um, in their in the playground um, and all of this supplemented with commercial spaces like uh, a bistro and hair salon and other spaces so the generations campus um, has public spaces and private spaces um, in the uh, public par part uh, on the campus itself uh, we treat it like a village there are pathways and parks and playgrounds and water fountains and uh, there's places for barbecues and picnics and outdoor events and places for gatherings. Uh, then you come to the, the main uh, building, uh, which is uh, uh, treated as Main Street. There's a bistro and a library. There's a hair salon. Uh, there are spaces for uh, exhibitions, for uh, artwork. There's spaces for classes, spaces for exercise. There's a theater, uh, places for gatherings. There's uh, ex exclusive spaces for volunteers. There is um, workspaces and uh, private spaces for uh, private birthday parties. Um, and uh, there's also community engagement uh, 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 spaces, spaces for uh, weddings uh, to take place, spaces where soft sports can take place like badminton and uh, uh, other uh, soft uh, sports. Uh, and uh, spaces where families can come together for bre breakfast. So this is this is uh, an element of uh, Main Street that was designed into the facility itself. And then you move backwards into the residences that start to become a little more private with uh, the private spaces, the lounges, the dining spaces, quiet reading spaces, uh, and other spaces required for uh, residents. Um, and then we've got neighborhoods. Um, there are four floors um, in the... Uh, assisted living facility and uh, on the four uh, floors, we've got three uh, wings and uh, that uh, uh, is designed to have 12 neighborhoods. And each neighborhood is a cluster of residents that come together as uh, a family of residents that can actually mingle and work uh, and uh, play together and recite together, much like uh, you would have a family in a household coming together. And so the uh, whole concept of neighborhoods was actually built into the design um, right from the uh, outset. And, um, and then we, we've got the private living spaces for uh, uh, individuals as well. Um, and the aspect of the design took into account that this needs to be a vibrant place where people come to live out uh, their, uh, their lives, uh, not, not a place for end of life. Um, so this is the campus, um, and uh, the uh, uh, phase one is the seniors living campus with uh, the 40 independent living uh, units that's been already uh, in operations for a few years. Uh, the care complex is at the back, um, and you can see it's a 140,000 square feet care complex. The front part of it um, has all of the 
uh, Main Street uh, 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 facilities such as the bistro, the hair salon. There's a early learning uh, center um, that's built in there, a multi-purpose hall where weddings and other activities can take place. We and we've got four gardens actually built into the uh, uh, the, the outside as well. Each garden has a very specific uh, purpose. Uh, there's a courtyard activity courtyard that actually connects uh, into the multi-purpose hall as well as uh, into the uh, uh, the uh, dining center, so that you can have uh, all kinds of uh, events uh, planned uh, both on the inside and on the out outside as well. And you can see the neighborhoods, um, north, uh, south, and east uh, neighborhoods on each uh, one of the floors. Um, here's a picture that shows the front, uh, which is the uh, uh, 40 units uh, independent living. And at the back, you see the care complex. Um, this is a picture from the back of the uh, independent living. This is the care complex main entrance uh, from the front. On the left hand side is uh, the large windows. You can uh, is uh, 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 right uh, right behind that there is a library, uh, and there is a, 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 a bistro uh, and a hair salon. On the right hand side, that's the early uh, uh, learning uh, facility, and then on the far right hand side, I'll show you uh, in just a minute. There is uh, the uh, uh, multi-purpose hall, uh, as you can see here, um, and then there's a courtyard that actually uh, connects to that as well. Um, the uh, let's take a look at the care complex um, in a little more detail. Um, and each one of the care complex neighborhoods has been designed so that you get natural lighting and you get uh, incredible views into either the courtyard in the front, the gardens at the back. Um, or uh, the gardens in front. And at the back, we've got public green spaces as well. And there's connected walkways and pathways right through the entire facility that leads uh, all the way to the back. Um, and um, the, this just uh, shows some of the elements. Uh, I just wanted to highlight the neighborhoods. When each neighborhood is clustered up with their own lounges, there is a, a lounge for the entire floor and dining facility for the entire floor, but uh, the neighborhoods are designed to be uh, uh, semi-private uh, spaces where uh, groups of neighbors can actually come together in a family setting. Um, this is the front entrance, and you can see that uh, standards uh, for finishing um, have been upscaled. This is the main uh, rotunda area. Uh, you can see the multi-purpose hall entrance on the right-hand side with the reception area on the left-hand side. The second floor was designed for dementia and it's glassed, uh, uh, behind glass uh, partitions. Uh, but again, you can have natural lighting and uh, lots of uh, spaces for uh, residents to actually move around. Um, uh, looking backwards, uh, we've got the bistro and the hair salon on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side is the early childhood uh, development center. Uh, by the way, there is a tremendous amount of uh, art pieces in uh, the building. Uh, all of the art has been done by volunteers, and you can see there's amazing art pieces right throughout the entire facility. This is the library at the back, uh, the crafts area, and the bistro. Um, this is the multipurpose hall uh, that actually functions uh, for light sports as well. You can see the uh, the metal uh, posts uh, where the badminton uh, uh, posts uh, actually go. Um, so that uh, not only uh, is it something that the uh, residents can actually use, but uh, community can actually have uh, activities in here as well. This is the private dining uh, where families can come together for uh, meals. So that's, for example, a, a breakfast on a Sunday morning, a uh, birthday party with their uh, care uh, uh, loved ones in the facility. Uh, a picture of uh, one of the rooms. Uh, a spa, uh, each floor has a, a spa in there with fireplaces uh, built in. Uh, these are lounges. Uh, you can see the upgraded finishings uh, in terms of the furniture. Uh, these are the end lounges uh, in the neighborhoods. And uh, the four uh, gardens, uh, each one has been designed uh, very carefully. So, for example, uh, in the space G, uh, we've got uh, planters that are uh, accessible planters uh, uh, by uh, individuals in wheelchairs. And um, the, the uh, plan there is that uh, the residents will actually be able to, with, with the assistance of volunteers, 
plant uh, plant uh, vegetables and flowers and other things. Um, and so there's the, the entire environment is designed to be very, very engaging. Uh, the contemplation areas here have uh, water fountains and you can actually sit in quiet meditation or contemplation outside in the on a nice day in the gardens uh, as well. Uh, we've got a dementia uh, 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 designed uh, facility on the outside as well uh, uh, here where dementia residents uh, can actually walk around um, in a safe uh, environment or in, uh, uh, in an outdoor space. Um, so there's, uh, in all of these spaces, we have uh, opportunities for volunteer engagement uh, in the village with assisted gardening, uh, with barbecues, with afternoon yoga, with uh, other activities with the residents. And in the main street, there's lots of things there that the volunteers actually uh, undertake as well. Uh, and then all the way into the uh, private uh, residences as well, activities with uh, games and uh, uh, with uh, reading and, um, and organizing movies and special events uh, in the neighborhoods, uh, friendly neighborhood volunteers that actually understand the needs of each one of the residents uh, and then uh, making sure that residents are engaged and not isolated. Um, and then family engagement, uh, same thing as well. The families can engage in different parts of the uh, campus. And then finally, uh, community engagement in the different parts uh, of the camp campus as well. So um, that's uh, uh, the design and the uh, overall aim is raising the service delivery bar uh, with an intentionally designed uh, building that actually allows for a higher quality of life experience. And it serves the needs of all of the residents, but also family members, staff, volunteers, and community, uh, and wel welcomes each one of the stakeholders into the building, uh, into the public spaces, but also allows for private uh, and personal spaces with a cultural uh, inclus inclusiveness that's actually built uh, into the design of the building itself. And the gardens are designed to actually uh, evoke uh, different aspects of meaningful engagement on the part of the residents. Uh, and uh, all of the entire facilities uh, got elevated finishes uh, and volunteer engagement throughout the building is a key component of this uh, with a heightened level of care and engagement. So that's uh, that's sort of uh, a summary of the uh, uh, Generations Project in Calgary. Uh, that's fantastic, Nashir. That was uh, really um, an insight. I was going to say the design, the amount of effort in the design, it was so elaborate. It, uh, it's almost like the effort you might put into designing the uh, campus of a, uh, of, a, of a residential university, uh, right? Uh, and, and it seems there's a lot of depth in there. Yeah, the, the uh, challenge that we were given as a design team was uh, we, we wanted to, uh, we were told that uh, we can't just replicate the design of uh, what is already out there. We had to actually step, step up the design. And so, that required a lot of thought, a lot of uh, research and a lot of engagement with experts to try and actually understand um, how do you bring a design to life so that it actually facilitates a higher quality of life in the building itself? Absolutely. I, now, I think one of the questions that just came in the chat, and it's an interesting question, you've put so much effort into creating these integration and interconnections. How did COVID affect any of this or, or if it did? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, I think hindsight is 2020. Uh, we, when we were designing the facility, the facility um, had some elements of, uh, of technology built right in. And so every room is already wired. Every room has technology in there. Uh, the one thing that uh, we hadn't done uh, was we hadn't actually, uh, while, while this facility, the rooms already designed for it, we hadn't actually put communications uh, video communications uh, technology into the rooms itself uh, prior to COVID. Uh, with hindsight, we would have taken the extra step and uh, enabled that, although most of the residents did actually uh, participate with their families um, uh, through some kind of video uh, conferencing and engaging. Now, I, um, I think that uh, COVID really impacted uh, this building like every other building. Uh, a couple of elements really helped out. Uh, one was that the building has spaces uh, that uh, that allowed for the staff to use those spaces to uh, uh, do programmatic uh, uh, content in an isolated way. Uh, for example, the neighborhoods, the 12 neighborhoods could be isolated on their own. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they were self-contained with lounges at the end and uh, 
And so that that was a, a, a key element of uh, trying to actually deal with this. Um, and um, the uh, team actually found other ways of engaging um, from a distance because we've got larger facilities. They could they could still have families drop in, uh, still maintain distance, and still engage uh, with the residents. Fantastic. Now, now one other question that came in that I think is also relevant. Now, this is obviously visionary, and this is really you've raised the bar. You're ahead of the game, but there's a lot of infrastructure already out there. Are there any key elements that you think could be adapted in the existing infrastructure around the country? That might bring at least some elements of what you found is the most effective. Yeah, uh, there are, um, and, and I think this whole notion of volunteer engagement is a huge component of uh, the success of uh, what we are seeing with generations. And you know, I, I would say that uh, uh, one key element is that uh, we need to uh, make sure that the residents in such facilities are not not viewed as a homogeneous group. Uh, you know, they. They have individual needs. They have uh, they need personalized care, and um, the the caregivers uh, need to understand what uh, each uh, resident's needs are, and they are different from resident to resident. And uh, the volunteers can actually assist in um, in those kinds of uh, uh, understanding of the needs of the residents, and perhaps even allowing to. Uh, a certain degree of engagement that actually goes beyond the caregivers because the caregivers can only do a certain amount uh, and the volunteers can actually enhance the, the programmatic content even in existing build, building designs. And so there is an element of that that, that mm. I think can, uh, uh, can translate well into even existing uh, uh, buildings. But uh, wherever there's a new building design going on, um, I think bringing the design elements uh, into being in a way that actually supports these elements much better uh, allows for a, a better outcome. For example, we've got volunteer spaces already designed in, in this building that allows for volunteer engagement at a much more deeper level. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And I think that's something that we could all benefit from because uh, I think people do want to help and people feel better about themselves when they help. So having that type of uh, culture of volunteerism um, throughout our, our that strategy and it seems something that could be enabled even after the fact even if you can't redesign your building you could at least engage the volunteers now we should move to our panel session because i know we've got about 13 minutes left in this session so like there's a few questions we have and it would be great josh and if you guys could give your thoughts um on on these things so So, Josh, you mentioned, um, for example, there was a vision the province has for the care going forward. There was a vision that was pre-COVID. Now we are post-COVID. What's it going to look like three to five years from now? What are things that we've learned from COVID that could be incorporated in the vision that things might change? And I might adapt that same question and ask Nashir, knowing what you know from COVID, what might you change in in the way you build your next generations for example so maybe John sure. first. yeah I, I can take that one first i think um you know covid was the accelerant that the healthcare system needed as it relates to virtual care anyway and digital health and and this understanding that some of the barriers that existed before covid maybe weren't necessarily real and when push came to shove people adopted virtual care because it was the only option. It was the only way to maintain um, the healthcare system. And what they found was some of the fears around, you know, would it lead to, um, you know, significant growth in expenditures? Would it disaggregate visits? Would, um, you know, it, it lead to inappropriate or poor quality care? At least from what we've seen so far, that hasn't been the case. Now, I think we have to respect that the environment we're in right now is you know, somewhat artificial. And, and so as things start to normalize, are those the trends that we continue to see? And so I think one of the things that will be on um, all people across the healthcare system is monitoring how that happens and, and what, you know, as, as things start to normalize, what, what are some of those trends that we observe? 
And moving forward three to five years from now, I think you know the idea is some kind of hybrid care model. And again, I, I said before about centered around patient choice, there are visits in the healthcare system right now that you know should still be in-person visits. Um, there are parts of the healthcare system and, and encounters within the healthcare system though that can be digitized and be synchronous. There are parts that can be asynchronous. And so how do we redesign a care encounter or a care pathway that it takes advantage of all of those? And it's in person when it needs to be, it's video when it needs to be, it's text message or secure email when it needs to be, and it's patient driven and autonomous sort of throughout. That's a great point. If we could achieve that, we'd achieve the uh, trifecta, the quality cost access mandates, because that would be really amazing, wouldn't it? I mean, the, the goal really is the quadruple aim. It's better experiences for patients, better experiences for providers, better outcomes for populations, and you know, at least maintaining current costs. Yeah, absolutely. Nishir, what do you think? Yeah, um, so I think uh, Josh has uh, kind of covered um, one aspect of it. I think the other aspect of what we found that uh, we uh, had to actually look at um, uh, quite differently during, during the COVID environment was that we're a center that depends heavily on volunteer engagement, on family engagement, and on community engagement to actually bring uh, uh, the en entire environment to a, a vibrancy level that that is uh, that is at a, at a at a much more engaging level, and and so those those things started to break down as COVID actually uh, came in, and so what uh, what we started to learn was um, how do you replicate that? Uh, otherwise, you get into uh, all of these different uh, essential elements of well-being starting to break down. You know, mental well-being, social well-being, about uh, relationships. Uh, uh, physical well-being, uh, where they were confined into into certain spaces, uh, the whole aspect of a sense of belonging to a community starts to break down. Even spiritual well-being, where your uh, uh, traditional way of practicing faith uh, might uh, not be accommodated in a COVID environment because you're isolated uh, in your in your uh, in your uh, own areas. And so there were lessons learned from uh, all of these areas. And I think uh, what uh, uh, what uh, we need to look at is there are elements of technology that allowed for some of this engagement to take place, but there were also ele elements of uh, individual communities uh, within the neighborhoods coming together and providing a replacement for some of those elements that socially might not be able to take place outside of the, uh, that uh, environment. And I think those are the kinds of things that we need to think about a little bit better uh, for the next uh, next. Uh, uh, time we get uh, faced with a COVID like uh, environment. Um, one, one thing in terms of the building element uh, that did help us in Calgary is that we had taken um, an approach to lock uh, to uh, uh, outbreak uh, prevention and outbreak uh, spread uh, where we had uh, the ability to be able to isolate different floors, different neighborhoods, in different areas and that helped uh, a little bit but again i think um we need to start to think about this now that we've had a, a wake-up call to uh make sure that uh in future designs or in future uh programmatic uh, content we're actually thinking about all of these different essential elements of well-being and how we would respond in a, a COVID setting fantastic actually that's a that's a great segue into the next uh comment that was going to come up was pros and cons of technology. So we've heard a lot about how technology will save us. And, um, and, and obviously, right now we're using Zoom as we speak. So it's clear that there are advantages to technology. What do you think from your respective areas, pros and cons? Should we be putting it closer to the community? Um, should we look at something else? Should we be wary of something? Yeah, um, I, I mean, clearly the the one thing that worked well during COVID was uh, using uh, video conferencing technologies to uh, keep families engaged with uh, 
uh, with the residents, uh, with their loved ones in, inside the, these uh, care homes. Um, and uh, that that needs to uh, be something that we continue to look at and uh, per perhaps even enhance. It's not um, uh, it's not a, a, a replacement for face-to-face uh, -face engagement during normal times because that family engagement uh, physically is very important. But I think there's an element of technology that actually supplements that face-to-face uh, -face engagement in a very meaningful way. Uh, and jo Josh has talked about uh, you know the whole aspect of health delivery that I think uh, plays a, a very critical role uh, here as well. And uh, so uh, so that's one aspect of uh, technology. But the other aspect of technology is how do you actually use technology uh, for the residents to actually keep the residents much more engaged during a COVID time? Because you can't have other physical activity taking place. They can't go for walks outside. And are there other ways of uh, mentally stimulating them that leads to some physical activities and other things through technology inside the, the, uh, the, the uh, buildings themselves? Josh, did you want to add anything to that? Sure. I, I think, you know, I said earlier, I'm an optimist and, and hopefully touted some of the positives. I think, you know, one of the risks with technology is, um, you know, further furthering the divide between different groups. And I'm drawn back to sort of, if you imagine a two by two matrix and on one, you know, axis you chart health and on the other axis you chart wealth, a lot of, you know, digital health um, is targeted on a group that's both healthy and wealthy. And they're not necessarily the ones who need the technology the most um, because we know that health is tied to socioeconomic status. It's tied to other indicators where, you know, populations might be marginalized or underserved. And so how do we consider equity and technology moving forward? What are the scaffolds that need to be put around a technology to make sure that it's accessible to a group? who, again, might be historically underserved or marginalized so that we don't further that divide. And that can be between sort of population groups, or if we even think about, you know, geographies, the, the wealth of resources that I have access to in Toronto are very different than the resources that, say, someone in Timmins, Ontario would have access to. And so how do we make sure across the province that we're raising the floor so that those services are more available to a greater um, proportion of the population. Yeah, no, fantastic point, actually. Yeah, anything that furthers the socioeconomic divide can only lead to more instability in the future. And that's something that we'd want to address early on. So, so good point. So now we're saying technology could be helpful. There are places where it's not. We wanna make sure that we enable access to the technology across the spectrum across the socioeconomic spectrum. So, and we know there's lots of things in digital health that are being driven right now by top companies, right? Uh, people who are doing blood pressure monitors and heart monitors and all sorts of things. But who should be driving this to make sure that everybody's getting, you know, at least we would say equal access or at least, you know, the ability, who should drive this really? Either one. Sure. I don't know if you want me to take that first. I think it, it has to be collaboration amongst these different groups. Um, you know, so we can say, you know, there, there's obviously a trend in consumerism um, as we think probably more so about, you know, a particular demographic that, you know, grew up with digital um, is much more comfortable with technology. You know, they're going to drive the healthcare system in a certain way to meet their needs and, and demands per se. And so the healthcare system will adapt with that, but then it's also important for providers to move with them, to understand some of those trends, to adopt some of those trends and, and realize that, you know, in, in the end, where appropriate technology, digital health, virtual care helps to deliver better outcomes, better experiences at lower costs. And then, so, you know, patients are driving, providers are driving, and then I think we have government is where, where needed, government asserts its strength either to, you know, if a market doesn't exist, um, helping to create that market. And so innovation can come into the system where there's fragmentation, developing those standards so that everyone knows the rules of the game and plays those rules of the game. And, you know, where things are, are working as they are, 
and and doing well if it's not broke don't fix it you know not stepping into those arenas and so i think it's it's all three levels are going to help drive this change um so yeah i i agree with that but but if i were to actually just take it down to a service delivery level um in in a building like ours um, what we've been doing is to make sure that uh, that technology is accessible by all of the residents. And so um, if you go into a resident's room um, in, at Generations, you will see that they've uh, all got all of the ex uh, technology already uh, in, uh, embedded into the infrastructure of the building itself. And so now it becomes accessible by every resident, doesn't matter um, what their background is. Um, and there is uh, training um, through the uh, uh, through the service delivery uh, individuals that's uh, provided to all of the residents so that they can all familiarize themselves. Um, and there's assistance for engaging with uh, uh, with families and others uh, outside as well. So uh, th that's a very important point: is that you want to make sure that technology doesn't isolate uh, groups. It actually uh, provides for the entire group um, and. Uh, We've tried to actually build it into not just the building elements, but into the programmatic elements as well. That's fantastic. Um, I think we're almost at the close. I'm wondering if anybody, any of you have any last thoughts that you might want to share. Um, otherwise, I can certainly thank you. I, I, I have really enjoyed uh, speaking with both of you today. It was uh, phenomenal. I learned a lot, um, both about how the government thinks and how um, the folks who are actually doing the work down at the service provider level, you know, it was a great match, actually. I, uh, so I, and, and I really sincerely want to thank you both for your time and your willingness to um, join us and to, and, and to help uh, uh, make this conference successful. I also want to take uh, a few minutes just to acknowledge um, all the people um, from the University of Waterloo who, who enabled this conference, this two-day conference. It's the first one of its kind, actually. Um, and it was a joint initiative by the School of Public Health, by the Network for Aging Research and the um, Center for Bioengineering and Biotechnology, which actually falls under the Office of Research. Um, the folks specifically, Sheila Bodimer, Karen Khalil, Carol West, Michelle Douglas, Eugenia Zenos, Trevor Bain, Lowell Williamson, Craig McDonald, Janet Janes, Catalina Reyes, Elizabeth Wingate, Iju Chow, Kenrick Vassal, Carly Turnbull, especially. Um, she actually took a really big leadership role here. And, and a former staff member, um, Charlotte Armstrong. They all did a phenomenal job to, uh, to deliver a conference um, in the midst of a pandemic, and that too a first for us. So, um, so with that last comment, um, we have an open networking session that is going to start in three minutes. And there's lots of topics. So if any of you have time and you'd love to meet some of the speakers, they're going to be at those sessions. Um, feel free to join us.